So if we go back to our contract, page 281, number nine about prorations and adjustments. Well, the definition of proration means to divide fairly between the two parties. So we're gonna learn way more about this in unit 21. And what we'll do then, I would prefer, let's, let's talk about that when we have our closing discussion, and then we can come back here if you want to. And because it is contractual, that the taxes will be prorated between the two parties, any rents or any homeowners association dues will be prorated. In other words, the seller should pay for their time that they're there, the buyer should pay for the time that they're gonna be there. Number 10, home warranty. Oftentimes, when uh, real estate agents list a property, they will suggest to the owner to go ahead and sign up for a home warranty. It's a nice marketing item, you know, if, uh, to tell buyers that the seller is going to provide a warranty, which is an insurance policy, really. If something breaks uh, during the first year, there may be a deductible, but it really is a nice policy, although there are different ones, so you'd have to be certain about the warranty program that your seller is choosing and what does it cover. Number 11, well back to 10, the buyer can even ask for a warranty. Maybe the seller didn't provide one, but the buyer can negotiate and say, I would like for you to give us a warranty. Condition of the property at closing, better or the same? It shouldn't be worse, that's for sure. Better if repairs were negotiated and uh, made. Number 12, we talked about, didn't we, Monday night, about the destruction does not end a contract. This is the risk of loss provision, which says the risk is on the seller. In other words, if the property is damaged, it's the seller's responsibility to make that right. If the property is destroyed, the buyer has a right to say, I don't want to buy it, or they can stay in the contract and um, get the benefit of the insurance. We talked about the delay in closing or settlement. Avery was bringing this up. You can go back and read the lines um, line by line if you want to, but the delay is 14 days. And it's a 14 day delay built in because oftentimes it's hard to meet the target date for settlement. And it might be not the buyer's fault. It might not be the seller's fault. It could be because the um, lender needs some more information. It could be a delay because of that. So there's a built-in 14-day delay. And when we talk about days in the contract, it means calendar days. So exactly two weeks from the targeted settlement date, the delay um, would go to. Now, you, uh, I would go back and read this if I were, if I were you, because it does talk about if that 14 days comes, well, then we might be in a breaching situation uh, if it comes and we can't get the closing done. Possession really is at closing, and possession is at closing. Um, it's always been that way as far as I can remember for, uh, in regard to our contracts. Think about it for a minute. If possession was at close, if it was not at closing, if the buyer wants to move in before closing, that's going to be a lot of issues with insurance and things like that. Liability. If the seller wants to stay after closing, how would we get the seller to move? We would have to go through eviction process. It would be, it would just be bad. So most folks just say possession is at closing and the keys will be handed over to the buyer after everything is updated and the lawyer records the deed and we're officially closed. Number 15, you've got your addenda. And so this is a good section because it reminds each agent what addendum needs to be attached to this offer to purchase. We talked about some of it already. We talked about the contingent. We talked about FHA and VA a little. Um, Kevin mentioned if it doesn't, uh, if the house doesn't appraise out on an FHA or VA financing, then the buyer's not bound uh, to buy the property even if that happens after the due diligence date and they would get all their money back. Assignment, we talked about that Monday night. This contract is not assignable unless, one of, unless the parties mutually agree to it. However, 
uh, provision 17 discussed a tax deferred exchange. Have you, has anybody in here heard of a tax deferred exchange? Have you done a tax deferred exchange? You know what we're talking about? A tax deferred exchange is a um, tax benefit for investors who don't want to sell their investment property right now and, and get all their profit and pay capital gains on it. What they're doing is deferring uh, that situation. They're exchanging an investment property for another investment property, but the way that it's done works out where the, where the investor doesn't have to pay tax on the profit because the profit really didn't pass through their hands. So we'll talk about this when we talk about capital gains tax. But it does say in that uh, provision 17, if one of the parties is in a tax deferred exchange, well then the other party is to cooperate and there may even be an assignment. And so that would be the one exception. We talked about 18, that death does not terminate a contract, bound to the heirs, successors, assigns, survival, any provision contained will uh, survive the closing, entire agreement, there are no other inducements, there's no other representation, no other forms other than what we have spoken about here, and the transaction. Look with me, if you will, to page 285, and you see the notice section of this offer to purchase. Page 13, page 12, I beg your pardon, of the offer to purchase. In your reading, it says this page is not contractual. This is an information page. And if you'll look at the left-hand side, it's buyer's notice information, and the right-hand side is seller's notice information. Now what I've seen in the past is the real estate agents put their notice uh, information where they can be contacted because didn't we learn when we work with real estate agents that all information flows through them. And so I don't know that the agents are putting in buyer information and seller information because then those two parties would be apt to contact each other and that could lead to could lead to some conflict of uh, could lead to some a situation. So we dialogue between each other as real estate agents. I do want to point out to you uh, under the buyer's notice sign, you see selling agent notice address. On the right hand side, you see listing agent notice address. The term selling agent is not the seller's agent. Selling agent has the buyer. The selling agent is who brings the buyer. I know. I, even in some questions, you do see a question and it'll say the seller's agent. Well, they're really the listing agent. The seller's agent is called the listing agent. They listed their property, took it to the market to look for a ready, willing, and able buyer. The selling side is the um, selling agent. And by the way, if you look at that side, it does not necessarily mean that they are a buyer's agent. We talked about that a little bit. You can sell property to buyers who are customers. And so you still would be called the selling agent and get the sale part of the split commission. It's important that the agent uh, check off what uh, agency they're in. This is your confirmation of agency. And then you'll put your uh, license number and the information uh, that you would like to be in here for contact information. So I suppose if, if I were a listing agent or a buyer's agent, I would probably want all the information about the other agent as possible because I want to be able to contact them in any way possible. <coughs> Does that make sense? In other words, if I, was a sell, if I was a listing agent and a selling agent brought an offer and all they have is their phone number on this notification page, I'm going to ask them, is that how you want me to communicate or can I communicate via your email too? In other words, all forms of communication should be addressed here so that we know when the offer is signed 
how we can get in touch with the other party. I think that would be important. All right, go with me to page 287. And there is an offer to purchase here that says vacant lot or land. We're not going to go over this line by line because actually it's real similar to the one we just went through. But it is different because there's not going to be the fixtures provision. If you glance over this, it's almost a mirror image, but there's not going to be the fixtures provision and there's not going to be the personal property provision because we're selling vacant land. There's the due diligence and all of that, a lot of similarities. There's buyer's obligations and representations, seller's obligations and representations, and a whole lot that looks the same with a few differences. The commission says we need to be competent and know which form to use on any given transaction. So if you get a test question and it says the, a, the buyer wants to buy a vacant lot, which contract form would the agent use? And of course, you'll have a multiple choice uh, to answer that question, and it needs to be the vacant lot form. Go with me to page 298, please. We did allude to Rule a, uh, 112, I believe, the other night, where we, where we talked about the commission rule of what needs to be addressed in any sales contract that your company decides to use. I want to make real clear to you that the Real Estate Commission doesn't tell us what forms to use. It's up to your uh, company you affiliate with and the broker in charge. I would wager most realtor for, um, companies use the realtor forms because why not? If we're in a cooperating business, it's nice to know that if we get an offer from another real estate agent that we understand the provisions in that in that form. So I would imagine most folks use the realtor forms, but it's not a requirement from the Real Estate Commission or the Realtors Association. So if you just glance at the Rule 112, the Commission says address these items in whatever offer to purchase and contract that your company uses. And guys, we went over a whole lot we went over way more than these and so everything the commission says that we need to address by commission rule we did address so you can kind of glance at them and you can see we talked about that we didn't talk about number 19 though and this is an ideal testing area the commission says there are certain things you must address in an offer to purchase and contract and there are certain things that you should not put in an offer to purchase a contract. I would remember your sales commission does not belong in the sales contract. So I'm under 19B, one and two. So you do not put your commission in the sales contract. Can anybody tell me why not? Because um, Damara said because the contract is between the buyer and seller. You are not a party to it. So your uh, commission was already addressed or should have been addressed in your listing agreement and in your buyer agency agreement. Does that make sense? Do not put in the offer to purchase, seller to pay me 3%, that's a violation of your license law. And then of course, no disclaimer of liability should be put in any kind of a real estate contract. Any questions on any of that? Alrighty, next page. One thing I did want to uh, bring up to you is the top uh, very important point. In practice, they're letting you know the commission does not develop our sales contracts. They don't preprint any of these contract forms. They are uh, realtor forms that most of us use, and it would be up to your company. I would pay attention that in a sales contract, the seller could be referred to as the vendor and the buyer could be referred to as the vendee. So when you're reading an exam question, you really need to be open to the fact that they might not say seller, they might say vendor. And they might not say buyer, they might say vendee. We talked about <coughs> contracts need to be in writing to be enforceable, and they're reminding <coughs> us that electronically, uh, email, you know, that sort of a transmission is enforceable. 
We talked about the offer and acceptance, counter offers, page 301. We even talked about how we're going to get the signing of the offer to purchase communicated over the net. So we talked about all of that except for the mailbox rule. So let's talk about that a minute. The mailbox rule is an antiquated, it's an old law, but it's still a law, everybody. It reminds me of the uh, Pony Express. Back in the way, way, way back in the days, the mail is going to get to you sooner or later. And you've always, haven't you always heard the postal slogan, we will get it to you, rain, sleet, hail, or snow, you will get it. The mailbox rule says if an acceptance is placed in the U.S. mail, so visualize the blue mailbox, if the acceptance is placed in that mailbox to the proper party, it's a contract once it's placed in the mailbox. Because it's presumed, well, it doesn't say it's a contract. It says it's delivered to the person you're mailing it to. And if we're mailing it to the person on the other side, we can say it's a contract. Are you following me? It's kind of like um, when we said... There's a seller and a buyer, and if the offer went here and the seller accepted it, we know it's not a contract yet. It's got to get back over here. And we said the seller or their agent can call, they can email, they can fax, they can leave a voicemail, they can any way physically deliver it. They can also drop it in the mail. When it's dropped in the mail to this side, it's considered delivered to them. And if it's delivered to this side, it's a contract, isn't it? If the seller signs and mails it to their agent, that's not a contract, but, the, it, but it's considered delivered to this agent. And then this agent can pick the phone up and call over here and communicate acceptance. So in other words, we don't wait, have to wait until we have it in our hand to say we're under contract. The mailbox rule, I would be surprised if it's even used. We don't use that anymore, I'm sure. We've got UPS and FedEx, we've got email, DocuSign, but guys, it's still a law. And you could see it on a test question. You need to understand, once it's dropped in the blue box, it's a felony to try to get it out. And so it's headed and is considered delivered uh, to the person that it was addressed to. Bottom of 301, termination of offers. <coughs> Guys, I would pay attention to that because we learned about termination of agency and termination of listings. And then we talked about discharge of contracts. Well, now we're talking about termination of an offer. The big thing to remember is an offer is not a contract. It's in the offering stage. So that means that death of the offeror or offeree would terminate the offer. It could be rejected or countered. The parties could agree. Uh, well, actually, somebody can just withdraw, couldn't they? Either party can withdraw. Any offer is revocable until it's been communicated that it's been accepted. Page 302 and uh, several pages here. This is where we went over the major provisions in the contract tonight. If you'll go with me to 307, it's given you a list like was in the contract of any addenda that might would affect the offer to purchase that maybe the buyer or seller needs to add. You do need to understand which addendum would be the proper one to use. So if you're questioned about a buyer getting an FHA or a VA loan, what addendum would be proper to attach? Well, then I hope we can think of this financing addendum for FHA, VA. I mentioned to you that the parties could negotiate buyer moving in before closing or seller staying after closing, and there's an addendum for either one of those, and it does talk about the liability and who's going to have insurance and that sort of thing because that would be major thing to, uh, to make sure this understood. You guys told me about the lead-based paint addendum today. Page 309, you see the additional provisions addendum. This addendum, I would suspect, is used very uh, often, really. The number one item on this addendum 
Take a minute and read that. Expiration of offer. Let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say we want a response by this date and time. It doesn't say that, does it? It says we want an acceptance by this day and time. In other words, the buyer might be saying to the seller, and I'm going to paraphrase and just use my own words, it's almost like they're saying take it or leave it. We need to know, are you taking it as it's written? Because we may have another house that we want to make an offer on. You're our first choice, and we, want, we don't want to wait around. So they're basically saying, let us know if you take it. We don't want any negotiating. We're not asking you to respond with a counter or anything like that. Are you taking it or not? And then there'll be a time frame there. How would you react as a seller if you received an offer with that? How would you react if you received an offer and it had a deadline date and it says basically take it or leave it, even though I'm paraphrasing, how would you respond as a, a seller? It depends on what the price is and how much money it is. It depends on a lot of things. My experience has been that, um, and this is just a long time ago, my experience has been that it kind of puts sellers off a little bit, that, the, that we're being asked to respond on a deadline. <laughs> Guys, we ought to respond quickly anyway. You know, all offers need to be worked on immediately, but if I like what y'all said. If the terms are good, why not, right? And so um, maybe the terms would be good with that kind of a provision. And then we were talking about the mobile home while ago, and so this addendum would be attached, number five, if there's a, um, a mobile home that's still mobile, you need to get the VIN number and information there to make sure that that's all filled in. Page 311, I want you all to um, look over that before tomorrow night because we're at a, we're at a good stopping point. Uh, so we'll pick up here, talk a little bit about some of the agenda, and we'll get into the land contract and option. Let me tell you, the land contract is level one, and the option to purchase is um, a higher level, level two. All righty, I'll see you tomorrow night, and I appreciate y'all doing your group work tonight. I really do. Thank you very much.